All right, welcome to the Dales Report podcast and happy to be joined with Stephen Sauls. He's the CEO of Rivalry. Stephen, how are things? It's good. Today's IPO day. It's been a busy IPO day. day. Uh, nice. Exciting day to say, uh, to say the least, but uh, walk me through. What was the morning like? Uh, I know this has been a long time coming, but um, before we get into the specifics about the company itself, uh, just maybe talk about what today meant to you and uh, obviously uh, everything that's come to fruition over the course of the last year or two. Yeah, it's great. I mean, we definitely had a bit of the classic startup life. We started in a basement in Chinatown in Toronto in my, in my partner's <laughs> house. And I was looking back yeah. on pictures of that. We matured out of that into an office and then another one. Uh, we've got 90 staff, 80, 70 of them are global in, in 18 different countries. So wow. we did a bit of a Zoom kind of market open. We had, you know, our guy from Brazil and Australia and Peru yeah. and everywhere, UK, and everyone was kind of clapping on a Zoom opening bell. And yeah, it was nice. It was very special experience. But but I'd say quickly that sports betting businesses go public earlier in their life cycle than a typical tech company. So we started this thing like five years ago. The sports yep. launched about three okay. and a half years ago because of all okay. the regulatory stuff, which is early. A tech company will go public in like eight years after launch. So it is early, but there's so much operational speed gain we get from being public where being a private regulated sports book, there's constraints on raising capital. There's, there's all these due diligence constraints on getting new payment providers set up, new licenses. So a lot of that is like unlocked being public. So there's like a speed unlock that happened today. So we're so pretty happy. I want to learn about, you know, rivalry itself. You've raised 44 million us yep. dollars over the past year. You're carving out as a leading position in the esports and traditional, traditional sports betting landscape. So for those unfamiliar, let's first find out more about the company and tell us, I guess, uh, about why investors should be excited about investing in it. Yeah, so Rivalry, we are a globally uh, regulated sports betting and media company. We say we focus on esports. So definitely if you go to the site or look at our social media accounts, we're very esports heavy and focused. A lot of that has to do with not just because we're only trying to target esports betters, but if you are under the age of 25, you are yep. in most cases way more likely to be watching esports than traditional sports. You watch both, but you're definitely more likely to be an esports fan. So we kind of use that as brand positioning and really just a way we participate in the community to acquire and build a top of funnel to like this next generation sports better. So like under 30s, whereas most sports books are targeting early to mid 30s and up. So it's a one to two generation difference. Yeah, uh, We've been super successful at that. We bring them in on esports. They will bet on traditional sports. We built our own casino product. So we've got a global license where we operate all that. We just earned a license in Australia where we'll be launching there in about a month. And Australia is the most valuable betting market per capita. So that's a country license. Yep. Ontario recently legalized sports betting. We should be submitting our application for that shortly. And then hopefully being able to accept bets legally in Ontario early next year. So yeah, we're just kind of expanding the geographic surface area of where we operate. We're going one to two generations lower. And an analogy we've used to really simplify this is what like a well simple or Robin Hood is to a Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade is what rivalry is to like a DraftKings or Scotia or, well, or a, um, a I think that's five. what I wanted to ask yeah. is the fact that 100% of your audience is under the age of 30. Yep. And they think a lot differently than say like I know DraftKings is spending what anywhere from two to three million dollars per day in the yep. industry. But yep. You got done saying like, I'd, I'd like to learn more about the whole esports betting landscape. And you're saying 25 and under is watching esports a lot more in sports betting. So if it's a Sunday yeah. afternoon game, Tom Brady and the Buccaneers are playing whoever <laughs> 25 and under, you would think if there's another event related to esports, that's where they're gravitating to. Is that correct? In most places in the world. Yeah. Like I think even in the U S we saw some data that that's a good point. That even globally. Yeah. I think, I, I think actually, honestly, even in the U S we saw some data recently, they're more likely to be esports fans than NFL fans or college football fans, something like that, which is crazy. So it is starting to happen everywhere, but definitely we, we currently are not active in the U S so our business is like basically rest of the world outside of that. Gotcha. And definitely in most cases, esports is more likely to be watched than the favorite traditional sport within the market. So how big is like brands like DraftKings uh, in, in, in international markets? They don't operate internationally currently. So yeah, so they, they are, yeah, they're, they're just a US focused operator. There was a rumor that they were going to buy Entain and Entain is like the Molson cores of sports betting. They are like the main kind of dominant player that would then make DraftKings global because those yep. guys are global. Yeah. But currently DraftKings is just focused on the US and this is what's atypical is the U.S. has been a big theme from the uh, investor perspective for the last year, year and a half. But okay. most of the U.S. operators just operate in the U.S. And that, that is uncommon. Whereas if you go elsewhere in the world, if you're anywhere in Europe, Southeast Asia, Asia, Australia, et cetera, and you're taking a bet somewhere, it is highly likely the, the operator you are betting on is operating globally elsewhere. Whereas in the U.S., yeah. 
you know, MGM, Penn, Bar, uh, the score, DraftKings, they are just taking bets in the US. So that's like a bit of a, you know, phenomenal. So this is a complete international play, which is a yeah. huge opportunity. So how do you match up? I guess, like, what are some of your biggest markets internationally? And how do you match up as far as competition in those markets? Yeah, so regionally, we're for sure the biggest in South America is the biggest component okay. of our business. I think it's for two reasons. One, esports fandom there is just feverish. It's, I mean, if you ever, if you ever watched any kind of sporting event happening in South America, that the, the South American sports fans are crazy. Like they're just like super yeah, passionate. So very. you take that under the age of 25, super connected demographic, and then also cultural proclivity for betting among younger people there is you know, really far ahead versus where it would be, let's say in the US or elsewhere. So it, like everything just came together where South America is great for us. Uh, and then definitely parts of Europe and Southeast Asia where it's legal, we operate also have been really successful there. And that's like most of our business. Yeah, Australia is a country where you need a country specific license. So we will be there soon. Australia okay. also is the most valuable betting market per capita in the world. So we're excited to be there. So um, and then within these markets, it is highly competitive. I mean, we the sports betting industry as a consumer industry is mature, saturated in most cases, highly competitive. Yep. That's why there's just like an arms race for capital in the US. But the thing that we explain to people is because of that differentiated demographic that we target, which by the way is like 40% of world population now under the age of 30. I don't think people realize that. So yeah. it's like, it is an inevitable That's generation. That's a big stat to like understand, right? Oh yeah. I mean like Gen Z is the largest generational cohort in history. It makes sense. I mean, every successive generational cohort, if the population is growing, should be the biggest one. But Gen Z alone is one third of the world, which is crazy. Think of how much that world like is going yeah. to, it, well, let's face it. It has changed rapidly over the last 10 yeah. years, but many believe that the next 10 will make the last 10 look like we were standing. That's still, what we say but... to people. So we, I, I remember the headlines like five, six years ago were how millennials, this is the, like a line we've used before. Like the headlines were like millennials are ruining everything. Millennials are ruining, like, it was kind of a meme, like the way we work, millennials are fucking this up. And I say to people like, if they if people thought millennials were screwing shit up, like just wait till like Gen Z comes into like most consumer categories. They're gonna like fuck everything I know. up. If, if you were worried about millennials, well, yeah. it's the, it's the it's the whole baby uh, boomer model, right? They're yeah. eighty five years old, still running for office, and they don't <laughs> know how to let go and just you know go enjoy the last few years of their life, and like that's okay, you know. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we need change, and I think that's everywhere across the world. So yeah, and, and back to your question, I'll answer quickly. Is is the way we compete is we don't actually run into our competitors that often. So even though these markets are very uh, saturated from a traditional sports betting, 35 plus year old perspective, and those guys are going toe to toe all day, we don't find in our marketing channels and the way we operate, we run into many people. Like it's, and that's why for us, like this is a global generational opportunity. Right. The US is great, but for us, like this is a global opportunity where like we want to be in the US at some point. We obviously want to be in Canada, but every market for us right now is a good market. So you raised 44 million US dollars over the past year. Yeah. So what do you think? You know, walk me through. I was going to say you're walking into office to meet with, you know, potential people that want to invest in the company, but you're probably doing a lot a lot of that virtually over the past 12 months. Yeah, a lot of this for sure. Yeah. Uh but what do you think was um I guess the key mission statement or selling point for a lot of people sure. um to what you've said so far? A few things. One, up until this recent capital, we had built the business over 4 years on less than 10 million US. Uh, some of our competitors spend that in four days marketing. Over those four years, we not only acquired a license, we built our entire tech stack. That's atypical in sports betting. Most, mm -hmm. of, most of them are licensed. We built objectively the most engaged esports betting brand globally. So monthly measured engagement into rivalry exceeds all of the aggregate of all of our competitors. We use that to acquire customers successfully when we did not have the balance sheet to rely on like a lot of our competitors. And then with that limited balance sheet, but the success of the brand and the product that we built, we have been growing at 14, 15% month over month on average for more than two years. So we've had like extremely consistent double digit month over month growth that's accelerated. So we're up this year, 21% month over month as the numbers have been getting bigger. We've got now 40 million in cash, zero debt. We make money on all of wow. our customers. So we've profitable unit economics. Our competitors in the US are not even break even on their customers yet. Um, and then, so yeah, what is it? How do you, how do you, yeah. how, like customer acquisition is huge. So what's the strategy, I guess, when it comes to keeping the cost down and, you know, yeah. like you said, uh, doubling revenue on a month per month basis? Yeah. So, so, so two things, one, it would be the success of the brand. Like that is kind of the well in which everything else comes out of when we try to, it's difficult sometimes to explain to capital markets because it's a, the investment in that bears fruit longer dated or in less obvious ways than like a large media deal, which is seemingly more obvious to people. Yep. So the brand being as successful as it is means there's like a certain amount of like clout we have in our markets. That means everything else we slot in from a marketing perspective 
you know, influencers, esports teams we sponsor, direct advertising we do, we still do stuff from time to time. The conversion rate and success is much higher. And that is just, that's just the success that comes with having great brand equity for any consumer product. So like that has been like a huge focus for us and continues to be. And that is like the source of success, I'd say. And then the second would be knowing how to hire really well locally in our key markets within the communities we're trying to target. So when we're approaching potential brand partners or whatever it may be, the relationship is just super organic and the amount of value we can extract from each other is, you know, usually more productive than I think, again, these top line brand level, like broadcast deals that traditional sports books are used to doing. So uh, super, super sort- targeted. Yeah. Yeah. From a cost perspective and uh, uh, operations cost, yeah. um, how do you find the right people in some of these countries? Like what's the process? Because if you're, you know, like I said, I would you say 90 people currently right now yeah. and you've expanded. Yeah. So what's, yeah. what's the 30 people in the last three months? I've up the wow. So how do you go about doing that? Because that, that's the tough thing. Yeah. Like as far as scaling up and finding the right people, that's sometimes, you know, the be all and end all for some businesses that are getting off the ground. That's kind of us now. It's like everything works really well. And we've kind of found a playbook that makes sense whenever we launch in a market. And now it's like repeating the playbook at scale of which almost all of that just has to do with people and like people operations. So it really starts with, um, we know, typically again, we always start with esports. We know the esports community within a specific country that we're looking to go into as kind of the first stop before we expand into more titles. And then within that game title, we've just built a pretty good methodology of understanding how to get into the community, see who the players are, see who the big actors are, yeah. build relationships with them. They connect us with other people that are relevant within the community that maybe have more business operational sense, but also understand the market try to get them to work for us. In many cases, they will come to work for us. And then they are like the nexus under which like the rest of the entire organization is built. So every mm-hmm. country has a country lead that is like the CEO of that country. We've spent a lot of time identifying and picking and hiring that person. And then they build their whole team under them. And that almost becomes self-fulfilling after that. It's like that first wow. person that's super critical and then everything flows from that. And strong work ethics, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, hard workers for sure. Influencers, uh, who have you partnered with? <laughs> not, I'm not sure if anyone here would recognize that they're, they're, you know, Spanish, Portuguese, Filipino, uh, other Southeast Asian countries, Eastern European guys. I'm not sure they're going to be like recognizable names. I'd say within our key markets, these influencers are from a total viewers concurrently watching them on Twitch or whatever platform they're on. They are usually within the top five to top 10 within the entire country. Wow. So we, yeah, so we're, we're, we're in a place where we're very good. And again, a lot of those deals start with betting for them is a thing they're not yet super comfortable with not all of them so that's why again it's not about who's got the biggest check showing up to the influencer and paying them the biggest check which is the case in more mature markets for us like there's an influencer we just signed um uh, in south america that is like one of the biggest soccer influencers not like okay. um not facing necessarily the traditional media more like soccer streamer on twitch and elsewhere just a large like gaming personality that is like very much into soccer there yeah and we had to it took us almost 10 months of just relationship building to get them to a place where they felt comfortable with our brand being the first time that they would step into sports betting because their audiences are so valuable for them. They don't want to show up and say, we got a sports betting sponsor. And everyone's like, oh, your gambling money's coming after you. Like, what the hell? You sold out, man. So like, we have to be like super surgical in how we do it sometimes. I get the feeling that over the next five, six, seven years of your model, it's probably going to be esports betting. Am I understanding that correctly? Probably like we... Sports betting is about 15% of our business now and and it's growing for sure. And the good thing about sports betting and esports is they're like inversely seasonal almost. So esports dies from like mid-November to to mid-Jan. That 60-day period is like the off season. Nothing happens. Sports is great then. So the more we can kind of have a mix, it's just better for the seasonality of the business or hopefully like ending seasonality in the business. But esports definitely we expect to continue to be for a very, very long time. The so what would you say right now? 15% is esports betting or sports betting, did you say? No, 80, yeah. So 85% is esports betting and 15 is wow. traditional sports betting. Wow. That's crazy how much this is growing. So there is a huge, huge market for this. You've yeah. talked about how you really don't run into a lot of competition internationally. Um, what is this mission statement that you say to a lot of people knowing that 100% of your user base is under the age of 30? Like, what is it that you're trying to build out here? We say it's like betting and and kind of redefining entertainment within that category. So we go back to analogy to try to simplify always. So the way that, for example, many people invest in Robinhood, the average account size there is measured in single digit thousands of dollars, not the way that it would be on like a Charles Schwab account. And many of the people that bought GameStop or AMC, what we had explained going back a year, as much as they wanted to make money on it, and I'll tie it to rivalry in a second, but as much as they wanted to make money on GameStop and AMC, 
it was also like a ticket into that community and like being part of the meme and being part of the whole like yeah. joke of the thing and the Reddit forums and being able to go on TikTok and show your Robinhood portfolio with GameStop. Like being part of the experience of owning the stock was as interesting as making money on the stock. And I think that's the big- 100%, especially with this generation. Yeah, and, and, and we, we have these conversations with tech VCs a lot because they're investing a lot behind that kind of thematic and has kind of been the DNA of our business forever is the way we do betting is like that also because we see that happening with sports betting is- we do higher volume of smaller bet sizes and the way that our user uses the product is more again like the guy who's buying GameStop. It's both, yes, I want to obviously make money on the bet. I don't want to lose money on my sports bet, but I also want to be part of like, I want to get like the clout and be part of like the community in which I'm part of with my sports bet and share my bet slip on Twitter. And, and they, people do all the time with rivalry bet slips and be part of the whole um, entertainment experience associated with betting. So for us, it's capturing that wallet of our customer in our markets which we're doing and monetizing well it then allows us like to have almost unlimited like horizontal expansion within that wallet so we so the, the business is really two main levers it's like getting more licenses to expand geographic surface area and then having the brand equity be as successful as possible so we can increase like like customer wallet surface area so the same way that DraftKings is doing nfts or Robinhood has added stocks and crypto we see like that people want their betting experience also to be like more multifaceted. So it's the same way yeah. we have like this original casino game. We're going to slot other things into it because it's all kind of analogous in their brain. Uh, all these consumer experiences. Great story to say the least. Okay. Ticker symbol. Where can people find you? Yeah. So tickers R V L Y on the TSX venture. Nice. And website, social handles, where can they find you as well? Yeah, so the website is rivalrycorp.com. It's our IR site. And then my Twitter is just my full name, which is Stephen with a V, Sauls, S-A-L-Z. This has been great. Um, congrats, obviously, on the job that you've done over the past year. But I realize it's, it hasn't been just a year. This has been years in the making. But uh, yeah. what an opportunistic time knowing the nature of the whole betting landscape globally right now and how it's just maturing and a lot of money being flooded into this industry. So I uh, appreciate you taking the time to join us in the podcast today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's been great. Thanks, Stephen. See ya.